everyone. I'm Tulo Chujo. I'm currently serving as an assistant professor in the Department of Botany, University of Science and Technology, Mekhalaya. Today I'll be giving you a continuation on the talk that is the second part of mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas. Okay? The first part, in my first uh, tutorial, we've discussed about mycoplasmas, uh, for which the link I've already shared. You can uh, subscribe and listen uh, from my YouTube channel. I will not be going into the introduction part because it is uh, similar with both mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas. Okay? So you can please check out the previous video. Uh, just a brief recap on what are these microorganisms. Okay? So uh, I've given in the introduction about the general characteristics, the structures, the forms, mode of reproduction the different characteristics and important disease caused by mycoplasmas are given all those and uh, the general characteristics morphology reproduction all those uh, characteristics of mycoplasma are similar with phytoplasmas okay so for that you can check the previous video i will not be going into detail otherwise it will be a repetition in this slide we will discuss about phytoplasmas okay but before we start, what are these mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas? They are the smallest and the most simple form of bacteria. Okay, so there are bacteria, there are microbes belonging to the domain bacteria, and they are the smallest and the most simple group of bacteria. Okay, and uh, they are pleomorphic in their characteristics. That means they do not have a constant shape or form or size. Okay, so the shape, forms, and sizes it keeps changing based on the different developmental stages of the microorganisms. Okay, and one of the most important characteristics which separates mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas from other group of bacteria is that this group of microorganism they do not have a cell wall. Okay, unlike all the other uh, groups in under domain bacteria that have cell wall where cell wall is present in this particular group mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas they do not have a cell wall okay so that is one of the prominent characteristics of this group of bacteria okay so today we'll be discussing on what are phytoplasmas okay this uh, and one more thing phytoplasmas and mycoplasmas these are the name of the genus but they are also used as a trivial name, okay? In general, also they are called mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas. So, so sometimes, even if it is in genus uh, name, okay? But they, they are not written in italics because they are most commonly used in trivial manner, okay? But when you write the scientific name of mycoplasma species or phytoplasma species, it has to be always in italics, okay? If when you write the scientific names, okay? Okay, so this is the taxonomic classification of phytoplasmas. Phytoplasmas are known as phytopathogenic molecules. Okay, so mycoplasmas are also known as molecules. Phytoplasmas are also known as molecules. Okay, why? Because they are named as molecules after the name of their class taxon, molecules. Okay, they belong to the class molecules. Okay, so. Uh, the difference between mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas is that uh, there are other slight differences but mycoplasmas are those parasites they which are isolated from animals and human beings okay so they cause disease on animals and human beings okay but this phytoplasmas as from the name you can know phyto means something to do with plants so these uh, molecules phytoplasmas are those uh, group of bacteria which cause disease in plants okay so that is one of the major uh, characteristic uh, difference in these two group of molecules okay and then when you see the name of the genus here uh, usually we have only one term for genus okay but here there is an additional term can be the test phytoplasma okay so uh, in the above I've given what this can be the this. What does this stand for? Okay, it is represented by C 
capital C, small letter A, okay? So what does this term signify? It is a nomenclatural status representing prokaryotes where the organism or species are well characterized but remain unculturable, okay? So the characteristics of the species are well characterized means well known, well differentiated, well identified, okay? But they cannot be still cultured. Okay, so as you can see from the genus name can be get us, this since its discovery, none of the phytoplasmal strains would be cultured till date. Okay, so to culture means when you uh, when it comes to microbiology, culturing means to allow them to grow under laboratory condition by providing appropriate requirements like nutrients, minerals, and vitamins, etc. under controlled condition, okay? That is the temperature, humidity, light, etc. Okay, so that uh, that allowing the microorganisms to grow in laboratory control condition, it is known as culture in general uh, description. But this particular uh, group of molecules, that is plant molecules, they are not culturable till they, okay? So to show that they are not culturable till they, the term candidatus is used, okay? So here I have given you the example of the species, candidatus CA phytoplasma citri, okay? A uh, pathogenic phytoplasma on the plant citrus, okay? Then here you can see molecules at the bottom. Molecules means uh, from a Latin word, moles means soft, cutis means skin, okay? So, they are all pole molecules because they do not have cell wall and uh, they are bounded by a unit membrane. Okay, so without the without the absence of cell wall, the outer wall is very soft. Okay, so that is why they are referred to as molecules. Okay. Then before going into the detail about the phytoplasmas, we have to first look into the history how phytoplasmas came into being or how they are discovered. Okay. So initially, when they were discovered, the researchers know that they resemble mycoplasma in especially not having a cell wall. Okay, the cell wall is absent in these microorganisms. Okay, but they were isolated from plants and not from the diseased animals or human beings. Okay, so that is why the identity of this uh, group. The now known as phytoplasma is not clear at that time, okay? So that is why they are called mycoplasma-like organisms, okay? Initially, they were referred to as mycoplasma-like organisms, okay? And since I've already stated that they are the smallest and the most simple bacteria, so they are so ultra small in size that they cannot even be detected with compound or light microscope, okay? So that is why they were detected only in the 1967 after the development of electron microscope, okay? long after the discovery of mycoplasmas of animal origin. And these mycoplasmas were already discovered in 1898, but a long time after the discovery of mycoplasma, the phytoplasmas were discovered. Okay? Then, the plant pathogenic mycoplasmas were initially treated as mycoplasma-like organism because their true identity remained unclear at the time even though they lack, their lack of cell wall is prominent. Okay? Their behaviors resembles mycoplasmas of the genus mycoplasma with ovoid to spherical, irregular to filamentous to tubular in shape, size and form. Okay? So they can be rounded. They are irregular filamentous means irregular thread-like structures, or they exist in tubular forms also. Okay, so that means they are like mycoplasmas. They are pleomorphic in nature. Okay, that means having more than one form. Okay, then MLOs have limited mobility. So like mycoplasmas, they do not have flagella, so they cannot move by themselves. Okay. But they can use the vascular movement in plants to move throughout the host. Okay, so here you can uh, find an indication that they are present in the vascular system of the plant. Okay, because in the plant vascular system, you know that it is made up of xylem and phloem. So xylem uh, involved in transportation of liquids, water, and phloem is involved with the transportation of photosynthetic 
products like sugars okay minerals nutrients in the plants okay so the, the in the phloem or the xylem there is constant movement up and down movement of plants because it is through the phloem that this photosynthetically synthesized compounds are transported to different parts of the body okay so with the movements with the vascular movements in the phloem these particular microorganisms are also transported to different parts of the body okay so they use the movement of these um, components in the phloem to move about okay they also feed on this component because if the phloem is loaded with uh, a lot of nutrients which are required by the plant for growth and development okay so they suck on these uh, nutrients and they survive and attack the plants at the same time okay then the second point they are specifically confined to the phloem particularly the seed tube elements which contains photosynthetically enriched products then in the year 1989 Tata observed a large number of MLOs from sieve elements interfering with the movement of nutrients particularly sugar present in the phloem okay so it was discovered again in 1989 then again in 1993 a few years later Nakashima and Murta reported MLOs from rice and various other crops from Asia okay so with the development of uh, complicated microscope more enhanced microscope like electron microscope transmission uh, electron microscope and so on this uh, the detection of my phycoplasmas or MLOs have increased in different parts of the world okay then in 1994 the MLOs were first renamed as phycoplasmas okay so the term phycoplasma it the it was suggested only in 1994 okay at the 10th congress of the international organization for mycoplasmacology okay so this particular congress of international organization for mycoplasmacology it is the organization responsible for studying identification of mycoplasmas okay so in 2002 Bove and Garnier reported that MLOs are true mycoplasmas. Okay, so again, there is still confusion. Even in 2002, Bove and Garnier they are saying that no, they are not phytoplasmas. They are true mycoplasmas. Okay. However, with more advancements in modern molecular and biological techniques, and especially in true phylogenetic studies, okay, mycoplasma-like organisms were finally recognized by its name, phytoplasmas. Okay. So. Phytoplasmas represents the largest group of pathogenic molecules. Okay, so molecules means it represents the class under which exists the species which does not, does not have cell wall. Okay, so all these molecules among different groups, phytoplasmas are the largest group of pathogenic plant molecules. Okay, there is another group which I will show you at the end of my slide. Then <coughs> phytoplasmas were designated and renamed as candidates phytoplasma species by Lee et al. 2000 through phylogenetic study and officially accepted by International Research Program on Comparative Mycoplasmology in 2004. Okay, so in 2004 it was ultimately accepted as candidates phytoplasma species. Okay. Now, with that introduction, we will come to what are phytoplasmas, okay? So, by now you will be having some ideas. So, we will discuss about phytoplasmas, okay? Phytoplasmas are now extensively studied in many recent researchers and even a global status of phytoplasmas and their diseases in different crops have been documented by Kumari et al. in the year 2019, okay? So now a global status of phytoplasmas, their causing of diseases in different crops are now documented by Kumar and Kumari and co-worker in the year 1990. Okay, so you can it is available, the PDF form is available in the Google. You can just type Kumari at all 2019. 
global status of phytoplasma. Okay, then you will get it in uh, PDF form. If you are interested in the current global status, you can go and find it out in the uh, internet. Okay, through this reference. Okay, then phytoplasmas are associated with over 600 diverse plant diseases worldwide and are mainly transferred by insect vectors like leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, aphids, and cyclists. These are small insects which feeds on the plants. Okay, so a very good number, that is 600 diverse plant diseases has been reported to date. Okay, and they cannot move on their own as already stated, so they need vectors. Okay, and in this case, they are transmitted from one plant to another plant by the small insects. Okay, then they are pleomorphic obligate intracellular parasites and occurs in the form of the host plant. Okay, so uh, intracellular parasites means obligate intracellular parasites means without the host they cannot reproduce by their own. Okay, then <coughs> this is a picture of phytoplasmas drawn from this uh, phloem tissue of plants. Okay, and then you can see this is the tissue of the plant then you can see this rounded structures some are small some are big these are the pleomorphic forms of uh, phytoplasmas phytoplasmas are mostly uh, roundish in structure majority of them and then you can see at the right bottom you can see what tubular form tubular like structure of phytoplasma is present indicating that they are very pleomorphic even in one Phloem cell, okay, of infected plant, okay. Then another picture is here on the left. You can see the transmission electron microscopy picture of a thin section in the phloem tissues of a phytoplasma infected plant named Gladiolus, okay, showing the presence of strong polymorphism. Okay, if you see the structure, you can it is not uniform. Okay, the size, shapes, and forms of these uh, phytoplasmas are not uniform. You can see some are bigger, some are smaller, some are roundish, some are bended, some are having branches, some are not having branches, and so on. Okay, so it is very highly pleomorphic. Okay, then this is how uh, in the right, that is uh, figure B, it looks like an egg fried uh, structure, like a sunny side uh, fried egg appearance. This one I've discussed under cultural characteristics in my previous uh, talk, that is. In the first part so you can go through that one and then these are the picture of colodes as visible from the binocular microscope okay so these are the infected tissues showing the colonies of phytoplasma okay not from culture okay since they are not culture at all okay then they are also reported to be present in the guts, hemolymph, salivary glands of sap sucking insects. Okay, so those insects that can suck the saps of disease plants, okay, the these phytoplasmas are also present in the guts, their salivary glands, and hemolymph means in insects, especially very small, small insects like leaf hoppers and grasshoppers, their the blood is absent, okay? They, they they do not have the red blood like us, but they have a fluid structure which uh, act as a uh, blood okay in terms of the small insects okay so they are also uh, phytoplasmas are also found in those hemolymph salivary glands and uh, guts of these insects okay and the phytoplasmas are mostly roundish in structure and their genetic material also has a low gc content okay so they are very small in terms of size even their genome size is very small, so they have very low GC content. Okay, then ever since their discovery, phytoplasmas remains to be unculturable. Some preliminary evidence that phytoplasma can be grown independently in exonic media has been reported by Conteldo at all 2012. But after this report, there is no other report that uh, that has uh, come out that phytoplasmas are culturable now. Okay, so the uh, it, it, it was able to grow in certain uh, specific media, okay, exonic media means specific culture media designed or formulated especially for phytoplasmas to grow, okay, that means uh, since they occur in the phloem cells, the 
film elements are also supplied in this uh, culture media. But apart from this report, there is no other report which uh, suggests that phytoplasmas can be cultured successfully. Okay? So it could be grown to some extent, but not successfully uh, cultured. Okay? Then the true nature of phytoplasmas associated with lower organisms, okay, that is grasses, rice, and so on, or other plants remains uncertain till date. Okay, so how, how are they associated, associated only in plants? Okay, why they cannot be isolated from animals? Okay, or why mycoplasmas are found only in animals and mycoplasmas are not found in the plants? Okay, all those preferences or their associations, it is still unclear till date. Okay, then since there are plant parasites, we'll discuss about uh, the pathogenicity. Pathogenicity is the ability to cause disease, okay? So, phytoplasmas are pathogenic to different variety of pores, plants, including vegetable crops, fruits, ornamental plants, bamboos, and trees, okay? Even trees can uh, be infected. Then they are very unique because they need plants for survival, but can replicate intracellularly in both the host and as well as the insect vector, okay? So they need plants for their survival, but they can replicate intracellularly means inside the cells of both the host plants, that is the infected or diseased plants, and the insect vectors, which carries them from one plant to another, okay? Then recent efforts have focused on the characterization of phytoplasma virulence factor. Virulence is the degree to cause the disease, okay, the degree to cause disease. Virulence and pathogenicity, they are interchangeably used, okay. So there are still researchers are going on to understand the virulence or the pathogenicity of this group of bacteria, okay. Then specific proteins expressed by bacterial plasmids and abundance of surface proteins contributed to the enhancement of pathogens virulence factor okay so when you study the structure of bacteria you can see that inside a cell bacterial cell the genetic material which is a double stranded single stranded circular or uh, non circular dna you will find that the dna is there and in addition to the genome chromosomal genome the chromosome there is an additional self-replicating organ organelle called the plasmids okay so these plasmids uh, in mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas these plasmids secrete specific protein okay and this protein along with the surface protein that means those proteins which are present on the unit membrane of the phytoplasmas okay these particular proteins they contribute to the enhancement of the pathogen virulence factor okay so some proteins have been identified from phytoplasma. Okay, then certain protein targets the nuclei of the host plant. So they not only target the cell wall of the host plant, but they can also target and degrade the nucleus of the host plant. They can these proteins which are secreted by the plasmids and present on the cellular the surface. Okay, surface proteins they are involved in manipulation of the plant metabolic process okay then the disease are mostly transmitted by leaf hoppers and plant hoppers small sap sucking insects researchers still await the unraveling of the pathogenicity of this facilitating plant pathogens okay so uh, the molecular mechanism the degree of violence or the pathogenicity the extent of pathogenicity all these okay detailed mechanisms are still not yet study okay so compared to other plant pathogens little is known about the molecular mechanism behind the pathogenicity and violence of phytoplasma okay in the recent findings by link 2019 still it is inconclusive okay then here i have listed some common symptoms of phytoplasma diseases we can go through one by one phytoplasmas are known to cause several plant diseases in different plants some common characteristic symptoms so some of the common symptoms are chlorotic foliage that means yellowing of the uh, upper part of the plants then stunted growth means giving a stunted appearance where the plants are not able to increase in height okay then progressive dieback of branches that is uh, 
rapid uh, death of plant tissues in the branches, yellowing of leaves, reduction in flowering, necrosis of phloem tissues. Since they are present in the phloem, it, they attack the phloem tissues and leads to the death of the phloem tissues. Okay, the, the death of tissues are called necrosis. Then dwarfism, proliferation, and bridges bloom, which you will see in the next slide. Phylody and parasites. Okay, so these are the common symptoms of uh, shown by plants infected by phytoplasmas. Okay, so here is the picture, both up and down, showing the richest bloom of infected plants. The upper one is the uh, from bamboo Dendrocalamus strictus, and the lower one is the lower left one is the infected or the uh, infected plant showing richest bloom. Okay, that is. The Fusia purpurea. Okay, so in this witch's bloom, there is uncontrollable growth and division of the cells. Okay, so it is um, comparative to uh, tumor cancer. Okay, so you can see the uh, infected plants where this bamboo is having a lot of excess leaf structure. Okay, that means the cells uh, are keeps dividing continuously leading to formation of excess uh, leaves okay in bamboos okay and in the lower one also you can see the lower one right side is a normal plant left side is the abnormal plant okay having which is good okay so the normal plant it have uh, distinctly a normal uh, leaves but in the richest bloom uh, condition there are excess number of leaves okay so it is caused by different strains of phytoplasmas okay then in the next slide you will see uh, phylody and parasites what is phylody abnormal development of flower parts into green leafy structures okay so if you see in this uh, figure on your right the instead of uh, forming the normal normal sepals and petals okay in the flower there is development of floral parts that is petals to green leafy like structure okay so you can see that the leaf like structures are growing on the flower okay that condition is called phylody okay then variance means development of green pigmentation on non green parts okay so not only do they uh, change in appearance from petals to leaf like structures but even the proper color of petals they uh, they lost the color pigmentation and green pigment develops okay so phylody means uh, turning of floral parts into green leafy structures variance means uh, instead of the normal color pigment the green pigmentation develops okay so this is the difference that you can see from the uh, figure here in the right where you can see both phylody appearing leafy green like structures and the uh, petals do not have the normal color but they develop into green colors okay so that is the condition it is caused by phytoplasmas okay then on the lower back you can see a palm tree caused by coconut little yellowing that is the common name of the phytoplasma okay so uh, you can see yellowing of the palm leaves and necrosis dead tissues of the plant, plant okay of the uh, palm tree okay so these are all uh, infected by phytoplasmas okay then uh, very less we are uh, not aware about these outbreaks and all but it is a uh, very common severe important phytoplasma outbreaks which has occurred in the past which has severely affected the country's economy okay so we will see some cases here about phytoplasma outbreaks okay so straws in 2009 reported that single phytoplasma outbreak in the year 2001 in apple trees okay caused losses of about 25 million euros in germany and 100 million euros in Italy. Okay, so a phytoplasma outbreak 
on apple trees can cause millions of euros loss in European countries in the year 2001. Okay, it was reported only later on after eight years in 2009 by Strauss. Okay, so that is one outbreak. The second one in North America and Europe, Ester yellow phytoplasma is known for causing several infections in several vegetable crops and ornamental plants, including apple proliferation, that is witch's broom, grapevine yellow, peach decline, that is uh, decline in fruit formation okay, of peach, then wild peach yellow and eggs disease, among others. Okay, This pathogen causes drastic discrepancy increase in crop yield in the two continents that is in America and North, uh, North America and Europe okay then over the past 40 years so it, in this uh, <coughs> duration of 40 years little yellowing of palm palm tree it is a very important economically important plant okay so the little yellowing of palm it killed millions of plants in Caribbean alone, okay, as reported by Brown et al. 2006. Then the little yellowing of palm destroyed the livelihoods of the people and major economic losses to the Caribbean nation, okay, as reported by Strauss 2009, okay. So it is not only killing the trees, but it is uh, affecting the economy of those uh, affected countries and also destroying the livelihood of those people. Who are dependent on the uh, economic importance of palm tree okay then phytoplasmas also cause several damages in forest trees the elm yellow or elm witch's broom almost eliminated the historical as well as new elm plantation in europe and north america as reported by Bertasini in 2007 okay then, in the Middle East, phytoplasma severely affected citrus production, whereas in Asia, it causes considerable losses in leguminous plants, okay, as reported by Greta Sini and Gudel in 2009, okay. Then, <coughs> phytoplasma infection causes significant yield loss in many plants. So, the yield loss here, you can see brinjal reducing 40%, cucumber reducing 100%. Pepper 93%, potato 30 to 80%, yield loss, tomato 60%, and so on. Okay, and all these are reported by several workers here in the year 2008, 9, and 17. Okay, so you can see that this phytoplasma outbreak is still prevalent even in the recent years. Okay, then how to control phytoplasma disease in plants? Okay, so there are a few steps. Uh, still, it is a uh, problematic and challenging uh, aspect of uh, aspect, uh, existing aspect, but some uh, control of uh, phytoplasma diseases have been achieved to a small degree. Okay? So, the first one is by gibberellic acid treatment. This is a plant growth hormone, and this treatment induced symptom recovery in infected brinjal plants and an increase in recovery rate was observed in gibberellic acid followed by nadiramycin treatments okay so gibberellic acid treatment plant growth hormone okay and antibiotic were used for treatment okay in the brinjal plants okay then rogging rogging means i've given here identifying and removing okay Identifying and removing of symptomatic plants accompanied by spraying insecticide reduced the severity of brinjal little leaf disease as reported by Sophie and co-workers in the year 1974. Okay? Then control of insect vectors because these particular diseases are caused by insects. Okay? So these insect vectors can be controlled using pesticides is one way to eliminate spreading of diseases. However, total elimination of insect vectors is not achievable despite heavy dosages of chemical treatment, okay, as a study reported by Farrell et al. 2007, okay, so we know that the insects, they are distributed in the nature randomly, okay, so we cannot go and target each and every insect vectors, okay, so that is a very difficult and impossible thing to do, 
So even after using high spray of uh, pesticide, total elimination is still not achieved. Okay. Then antibiotics usage is another option, but the cost of antibiotic production is huge, and its application is prohibited in several countries. Okay, because this bacteria we know that they tend to uh, get resistant to antibiotics. Okay, so it is uh, prohibited in many countries. Okay, so this is not an encourageable option. Then uh, Upa Upadhyaya 2016 reported that plants treated with antibiotics also do not produce any flowers or fruits. Okay, so it can be treated but those plants which are treated with antibiotics they do not produce any fruits or flowers. Okay, so it is no point for this treatment. Okay. Then approaches for management of phytoplasmas have been attempted in several ways, but unfortunately not even a single method of effective control of plants disease by phytoplasmas has been accomplished till date. Okay. Then development of cultivars <coughs> resistant to either pathogen or vectors will serve as a long lasting tool for control of phytoplasma diseases in plants. Okay, according to Kumari at all 2019. Okay, so one of the options available is to develop cultivars which are resistant to the pathogen or the insect vector, okay, like uh, the DP boom gel, which is uh, now resistant to the pathogenic insect, okay. So developing those kind of similar cultivars, okay, will be helpful in the long run, okay. Then, uh, Till now, up to now, we have been talking about the phytoplasmas and the disease caused by them in uh, plants. Okay. However, it, this phytoplasmas it has other application. Okay. And then here, phytogenic, pathogenic phytoplasma as the causal agent of desirable and economically important trait. Okay. So it can cause disease, and in other plants, it can cause some desirable uh, effects in economically important plants okay so under this one an example of phytoplasma as a causal agent of desirable and economically important trait is the induction of free branching in commercial posidia okay that is uh, euphorbia Ushirima, okay cultivars and this uh, benefit was reported by Lee et al in the year 1997 okay so in Pocintia, two cultivars are commercially grown. Okay, the first one is a restricted branching with ethical dominance, few axillary shoots and bracts, and the second cultivar is free branching with weak ethical dominance and more axillary shoot and bracts. Okay, so in plant physiology, when you study ethical dominance, it means the excessive growth of the ethical portion of the plants. Okay, leading to increase in drastic increase in height and decrease in branching okay so restricted branching means there's ethical dominance and the other cultivar is free branching where there's no ethical dominance or weak ethical dominance and a lot of branches are present okay so those two are the different cultivars okay so let us see which one is uh, economically desirable free branching morphotype is one of the commercial importance for large scale production of Procedure samples. Without phytoplasma infection, the plant needs six to seven times chemical treatment to induce free branching. Okay, as reported by Paul Julie at all 2002. Okay, then the phytoplasma BioP, this particular strain, is known to induce free branching. Okay, according to Nico Nicolaisen 2004. Okay, so when you see this picture, you can see the up and the lower one okay in both the up and the lower one you can see in the left where there is epical dominance and less restricted branching okay so you can see that the flower it's flowering only on the epical portion and there is very less branching okay this trait or this cultivar is not uh, useful for large scale production of posidia okay because the more branches they produce uh, the more uh, chances are there to get propagated okay so this uh, particular cultivar on the right with low epical dominance that is, is shorter and 
more branch okay this is the economically desired cultivar okay and you can see here there are more branches thereby producing more flowers so this is economically desirable okay and in those which produce this kind of uh, low apical dominance and uh, more branching they were found infected with phytoplasma the phytoplasma strain poi b okay so we can see that the phytoplasma it induces desirable changes in the traits of economically important plants like posintia okay then <coughs> phytoplasma can possibly induce changes in hormone levels or changes in hormone perception leading to changes in gene expression in the plants okay so they are uh, expected to induce changes in the hormonal levels and hormone perceptions okay the gene ep11 may play a major role in release of apical dominance and this gene is involved in cytokine signaling construction okay so apical dominance is mainly due to the synthesis of auxin in the uh, photosensitively active uh, region of the plants okay and the concentration of auxin is very high in the apical portion okay so the cells in the apical region keeps dividing keeps growing in length okay we know that the balance between growth hormones like auxin and cytokines are important okay for a balanced plant growth okay and these cytokines these are uh, synthesized in the root and they are transported up to the uh, upper part of the plants okay so the particular gene called gene ep11 may play a major role in the release of apical dominance okay and this gene is related to cytokine signal transduction okay as reported by nicolaisen and christensen in 2007 okay and cytokine is known to play a significant role in this process okay so when the cytokine distribution gets uh, equal, equally distributed and with the release in apical dominance the auxins will also be able to get transported to different parts of the plant encouraging branching okay so this is the existing probable uh, reason why phytoplasmas uh, induces uh, the release of apical dominance and increase in branches okay and then <coughs> cytokine is known to play a significant role in this process okay so that, that is one of the desirable traits of uh, phytoplasmas in plants okay then the other group of uh, molecules plant molecules is a spiral plasma okay so from the name spiral means it is kind of like spiral like structure so phytoplasmas majority they are uh, circular in structure they can be filamentous tubular in form also but those uh, phytoplasmas which are spiral like in appearance are kept under the genus spiroplasmas okay this uh, this is a bone stud spiral uh, plasma detected from the film cell okay this picture are taken from wikipedia there is a spelling mistake there then the taxonomic classification like mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas they are also called molecules plant molecules under the class molecules okay and the spiral plasma is the genus identified by Sevio et al. 1973. Okay. Then, <coughs> spiral plasmas comprise of another group of bacteria without cell wall belonging to molecules. Like phytoplasma, they are confined to the film and sieve tube elements. Spiral plasmas are known to cause plant diseases and were first discovered in 1970. While phytoplasmas, they have no well defined cell morphology, neomorphic, that is. Spiroplasma have well defined helical morphology, so they are helical or spiral in shape, okay, and they have well defined morphology. And this characteristic feature remains a fascinating mystery, okay, so it is still a mystery.
how? Because when we see mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas, they are highly pleomorphic, okay? But these pyroplasmas, they are not pleomorphic, but they have well-defined helical morphology, okay? And the reason for this uh, is still not yet known, okay? Then some common diseases caused by spiroplasmas include citrus tuberous diseases, that is formation of food deformities, caused by spiroplasma, spiroplasma citri, then constant disease, stunted growth and leaves turn red, which is caused by spiroplasma, Kunkili, and spiroplasmas are responsible for stunted growth in many other several plants, particularly of the grasses. Okay? So I hope uh, you have got a clear idea with the previous uh, slide, that is the part 1 and this present slide part 2, we have uh, completed the, the talk on mycoplasmas and phytoplasmas. I hope uh, you got an idea, if you are interested and want to go in detail, there are available literatures in the form of PDF, scientific literatures, the reviews are available in Google. The, the references are given, you can type those in the Google and you will get more material which will be more helpful for you. Okay? Thank you.